got a Bible, we'll go ahead and open it up to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, we're going to be continuing our series all day, every day, all day, every day. And today, is, uh, the title of this message is uh, Supply Lines, Chains, and Teslas. I'm going to try to bring all that together, okay? We'll, we'll see if I can uh, make this happen. All right? Supply Lines, Chains, and Teslas. So James chapter 1, go ahead and find your way there. We're going to start reading uh, in verse uh, number 5. We got to read verses 1 through 4 last week and just started there. I promise you we're going to make our way faster through this. We're not going to do four, four verses a week. Uh, we would be in James till maybe till the end of times. All right, but remember uh, what I said last week about James is one of the quotes I read is uh, this book and this letter that James wrote, it's a, it's a gritty in-your-face pastoral letter zippered up at times with some heated rhetoric. So he's dropping in these one-liners, the one-liners that hit really, really hard. And he's moving quick through ideas. So we'll actually kind of pass over a couple of sections in, in James chapter 1 because what he does is he, he continues to develop some of the same ideas throughout the book. And if you want to think about it, the entire uh, chapter 1 of James is really an introduction. And then he he, all of the ideas and themes that he lays out in chapter 1, he begins to uh, develop more throughout the rest of the book. So we'll get some of these other ideas as we go. And so last week we talked about through it to it. All right? the, way, the way of Jesus is not get me out of my trial. As James says, he's buried his trial. It's not, God, how do I get out of this? Get me out. It's, how do I get through? And when we go through it, we become durable. We become believers because that elevates our view of God and it molds and shapes us. If God has got, about, got us out of everything, it wouldn't shape us in any way. And so as we go through things, that's what shapes and molds us. Um, we read some verses this morning in Growth Group about, about how even Jesus was molded and shaped through the suffering of trials. And so if it was good enough for Jesus, I'd say it's good enough for us. But the question then is, and, and I think even Mike pointed it out after the service, is this. Y'all, so it sounds good, go through it. I'm good with that. Go through it, baby. I'm not trying to get out. I want to go through it. But how? Right? It's like, all right, I don't know I'm supposed to go through it, but, but how? How do, I, how do I go through this? Like, how do I make it through? How do I go through? And James was like, glad you asked. Glad I framed this question and wrote this in such a way that you would ask that question because he immediately jumps right in to the how. But before we get to that, I'm just going to tell you I like history. Um, uh, I, I really like military history, okay? And uh, Ben's the, you know, guy who served in the military and all that. I like to, I like to think about the military and all those things. So I want to take you back uh, to June 25th, 1950 uh, in, in, in North Korea and South Korea, in, in the, that Korean Peninsula there. And what happens on uh, June, June 25th of 1950 is uh, the North Korea... North Koreans have been working, uh, not telling anyone, and a surprise attack, and they send six six of their units uh, all through uh, into South Korea, and uh, it's a surprise attack. South Korea was not ready for it. The United Nations was not ready for it, and by June 28th, they had already taken the capital city of Seoul, right? Um, and, and what ends up happening is the UN forces have to begin to back up, back up, back up, back up. And I have a, a picture of, of the map in South Korea. It's kind of hard to see, but you can see the six fronts. And North Korea moves in. And, it, and it, all the arrows point down to this one little area. It's called the Busan Perimeter. And so what they ended up doing is um, uh, one of the American generals is like, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to back all the way up to this. And we're going to set up a perimeter. We're not going to let them go any further. And they give up a lot of ground. They give up a lot of ground. And this is what ended up happening. The, what the wisdom of a, a, of a military general saw this. He knew that as North Korea moves further into South Korea, what's going to happen is their, su their supply line is going to be stretched further and further and further. But what the UN troops and American troops and others were doing was they were backing up directly into their supply line, the ports there in Busan. So they were setting in their supply line right there. They had, the UN forces had all of their supplies right there and ready, while the, the North Koreans, their supply line was being stretched. And then they devised a plan where they would actually come in around and they would enter the coast in very dangerous areas and territory, and they would actually begin to cut off the supply line of the North Koreans. And over time, 
what happens is the North Koreans had to retreat. Uh, and, and very quickly this war ended because of this strategy. Get close to your supply. Stretch them out from their supply. And very quickly they'll run out of supplies, they'll run out of art, and they'll retreat. They'll retreat. This is the thing. The results of interruption to the supply line is this, it's second guessing, it's inconsistency and, and a consistent questioning and a lack of trust. When you're out there on the, on the front line and you don't have the supply line, you're like, I, do we have what we need? We can't be successful and eventually retreat happens. I don't know, maybe you don't like war uh, and, and military uh, history, but surely you can think about just recently, you know, when we had the, um, as what I put here, the great gas shortage of 2021, where, uh, you know, we were, we were going to the gas station with plastic bags and Tupperware bowls trying to get gas because we were out of supply of the fuel that we would need, right? And like, I remember, I remember pulling into the wagon down here, they didn't have gas, and went over, ran into a brother, brother of ours, and, and we were sitting there, and there was a line, it was 75,000 cars, and the line just right here, it was backed up all the way down to 321, all the way to the North City, just to get gas right over here, because we was in short supply. And we immediately started questioning, are we going to have what we need? Are we, are we going to have what we need? Are we going to have the fuel that we need? We all flooded the gas stations. This is the reality, man. When the supply line is cut, it begins to create chaos and instability and inconsistency in our lives. And some of y'all y'all did it. We, we do things that just don't make sense. We don't, we don't make sense, but it's because the supply line is short. You got your Bible? James chapter 1, verse 5. Word. 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 There you go. Y'all jumping in. I love it. Let's read. Let's get into the Word so the Word can get into us, right? But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given. Verse 4, one verse back we read last week. You're going to lack nothing. That's how he ends verse 4. Lacking in nothing. When you face these various trials, you'll lack nothing. And the very next thing James says is, oh yeah, but when, when you lack wisdom, it's like, wait a second. James, I thought we were, I thought we were in a place where we ain't lacking nothing. He's like, listen, you're not. But you're not. You do, but the God who's with you does not. To which we ask generously of him because he is a generous God. See, oftentimes man, we have this picture not like the song we were singing that God is running after you but that he's actually somewhere else and he may or may not. We're on the front line and the supply line's been stretched and we're like, do we have what we need on the front line when we face these trials? And often what we do is we begin to second guess, we begin to have a lack of of trust in God. And James is calling us back to this reality that we serve a God, Yahweh, who in Jesus provided everything we need. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father sent His Spirit, who now in us is leading and guiding. He is He's that connection. He's that pipeline. He's the one that's providing everything we need in those moments. When we lack wisdom, we have the one who has wisdom. So we don't have to stand in fear thinking, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? We understand that this is the truth. Prayer is the plot the supply line to the front line. Prayer is the supply line to the front line. You just like the American the, the UN armies backed up to that Pusan per perimeter where that where the the the, uh, the, uh, the the port was right there, so if they could get their supplies. You can back right up to the Spirit of God and have it's 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 you. You you can do that. All you gotta do is pray. Because what does he say? It's not on, this is not an issue with God. God is generous. Verse 6, but at, he who asks in faith, without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like a surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything. 
Listen, let him ask of God who gives to all generously without reproach. He's not, it's not a question if God will give generously. He will if you ask in faith. The pipeline is secure when trust is there. It's, it's, it's not being cut off. And so often, so often we, we get cut off because we don't ask in faith. We don't experience what we need from a generous God because we don't ask in faith. We show a lack of trust. A lack of trust. And the enemy knows that, that your victory and defeat will depend on the supply line. He knows. The enemy knows that you don't have what it takes at the front line to be victorious in yourself. So what he wants you to do is he wants to deceive you to think God is not actually generous and he's not going to provide you everything you need. See, it's an issue of the way we perceive and see God. Satan's tactic is always deception. And it's always deception around the character of God. Is he good or is he not? And that's the question we got to ask ourselves. And it ain't, a, it ain't a wake up Sunday and ask myself, well, God's good, so I'm going to go to church. It's a, I'm going to wake up Monday, and I'm going to know that God is good. So when I function within my reality at work or wherever I go, I can trust that no matter what I face that day, on the front line, the supply line's here. Because I'm asking in faith, and I know the character of my God. He's generous. He gives to all. He doesn't say some. He doesn't say preachers. He doesn't say guys who can get up here and sing beautifully like, like Marcus and Sue and, and Matt. He doesn't say that. Or, or ladies like Caleb. He doesn't say that some. He says, oh, that's you, friend. That's you. Boy's getting on it today. I told him I was fired up this morning. I, me and James just get along, I guess. I get in here with James. Man, it's a like mine. The supply line is, is, is yours to be experienced. You're right there. The spirit is there. If you want what you need on the front line, you've got to have faith. And faith is a direct reflection of what you, how you view the character of God. Deception is his tact, Satan's tactic around the area of the character of God. And then, and then what happens is deception results in a lack of trust in the faithfulness of God. So we're right there on the front line and we're like, huh. I can actually stand and do what God wants me to do in the midst of this trial. I don't know. I don't know. But he must ask in faith without that doubt. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For the man ought not expect that he will receive anything from the Lord if he's like that being a dope one good man. So you feel like you don't have what it takes and in certain situations, certain trials, well, the answer to that is that's true. But God does, and if he's with you, if you believe in the character of God, then you do have what it takes. And if you're in those moments and you don't actually express what it takes in those moments, it's not God's problem, it's your problem. You have a trust issue with the character of God. I didn't say it. That's what James said. Don't throw stones at me. That's James. The enemy knows we cut off supply lines, and the enemy must retreat. And many of us have been in retreat. And it's a direct product because we don't know how to ask in faith. We're questioning the character of God in our prayers. So my question is, is your pipeline secure and operational? Or are you just living on minimal rations? You know, when you get out there on the front line and you don't have a supply line, you're just, you're just living on yesterday's goods. Right, let's, let's make this stretch out the best we can. And some of us, that's what we're doing, man. We're, we're eating MREs for seven days. You don't know what an MRE is. That's like a, a, a ration, a military ration. Yeah. High, in, high in carbohydrates and protein, like 3,000 calories, 6,000, I think. Some of us, that's what we're doing. We're living on yesterday's victories or the day before victories instead of standing in the character of God and knowing that he gives to all who ask in faith. God, it's a new day, new trials, and I'm asking for new grace and new mercy. Sounds like the song I heard. Oh, yeah. Grace and mercy are new every morning. Every morning. Why? You're facing new trials, new things every day. 
And you serve a God who's willing to step in the midst of that. Is your pipeline, is your supply line, is it secure and operational? Only you can answer that question. I can't answer it for you. I know often when I fail and retreat in the various trials of my life, when I try to get out rather than go through, you know what, I can look back in retrospect at those moments and say, you know what, I was not functioning prayerfully. Was not in that. Let's keep moving. Because James bounces around, okay? So there we go. Supply line, prayer, 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 prayer. What's point number one? Prayer is the supply line to the front line. Prayer is the supply line to the front line. Know that. Know that. The second thing I want you to understand is we need to break the chain at the first link. So he moves in. We're going we're gonna to skip a couple of verses there, 9 through 11. I want to pick up in verse 12. It says this, Blessed is a man who perceives, perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say, when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust or desire. Then when lust or desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. That's the chain right there. Verse 14 and 15. You see the chain? Don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. God's not deceptive. He's not deceiving you. There ain't no shadow things going on. He's the Father of lights. You can see God gives vision, gives sight to those who need it. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we will be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. We have a purpose in those trials. We're, we're a first fruits. We're going to go through these as, a, as an example to all those who will come. So we have a purpose. Back to my point. Break the chain at the first link. Break the chain at the first link. And the first link is the desire. The place of the desire. That's the first link. That's the first link. And this is what James is trying to say. Get into that. Get it there. Let me show you something. All right, here's my analogy. Here's the first link. It's not developed into a chain yet. When, when, when you deal with sin at the root of the cause, the desire, the desire, letting go of that thing and changing it, removing it from your life, makes a little bit of noise. When you let that chain develop and you let it sink in and get bigger and bigger and bigger, when you experience the temptation of your own lust and then you conceive it as adding another chain and then you birth sin and that adds another link in the chain and then it accomplishes death. And how many of us know that one sin typically leads to multiple sin and it bleeds into other areas and it becomes in your life, sin becomes this thing where you got to put gloves on even to touch it because it's so disgusting. It gets real fucking heavy, right? And then you're walking around in your life trying to drag this thing around because you let it. You didn't deal with it when it was just. And when you drop this one, it causes a lot. It's, it's loud, isn't it? It causes a lot. Of, it, it makes some noise. And what I don't mean is it's just noise and it hurts your ears. I mean it makes some noise in your life. You know what I'm saying? When you actually begin, when you let when you let the chain of sin get to this right here, when you go and try to actually let this thing go, it's going to make some noise in your life. If your toes are in the way, it's going to break some. Not only that, you're going to get real dirty. I'm not going to try to get dirty up here. But handling that thing, you're going to get rust and corrosion all over you. When you could have dealt with it at the first one. That's a lot better. Do I need to do it again? Do I need to pick it up and drop it again? You get what I'm saying? James is saying, you don't have to live with this thing and, and, and causing all of this chaos in your life where it gets entangled in all the different areas into your world. Because you didn't, you didn't choose to deal with it, but it was this. Defeat sin at the level of desire. And this is the problem, y'all. Men, I'm talking to you, so lean in and look at me. 
You know what? We don't like introspection. We don't like looking within ourselves. You got to take a deep dive on the inside to get to the desire and begin to think about it. Like, where did this thing come from? Where did this? Where did this one link that can become that? Where did this come from? And that's a scary thing. We got to be transparent. And for men, what we thought we've been taught that to feel something is to be weak. And that's a lie from the enemy. It's scary to look what lies beneath. And this is the thing, what you discover about this link, and when you actually get to the root of it, what you realize is you'll be set free because it's not the desire that's bad. It's the perversion or the twisting of that desire. It's a twisting of it. And this is what we realize. Often it's tied to some sort of past trauma in our life. Some sort of event took place in your life where this good desire became this thing where, okay, the way I satisfy this desire looks like this, and that's a lie. It's what the world wants you to say. That's how you satisfy that good thing. That good thing. And then it swells up into this nasty, messy train wreck right here. And it, and it gets all over everything you love. And it's because somebody didn't help you be transparent, sit down with you with grace and mercy and love and leadership and talk about that link in the chain that started it all. And help you say, all right, that's where that came from. Now I know how to drop it. Now I know how, and that's all. That's nothing. You begin to develop that. Josh sent me a podcast, and I encourage every one of you to listen to it. If, you, if you're like, oh, Austin, I would like to listen to this, message me or Josh and they sent it to you. It's a, a, a podcast, this guy named Jason Wilson, and he's talking. And, and one of the things that he talks about in there is he says this, don't let your trauma time travel. Don't let your tra trauma time travel. Leave it where it is. Deal with it. Do it. And then let it step like there. Learn from it. Go through it. And be something better. But if you don't go through it and you just try to get out of it, what it will do is it will come back and it will rear its ugly head and it will become this big, dirty, filthy thing that it begins to get in, entangled up in everything. And to drop it in, boy, it's going to make some noise. Don't let your trauma time travel. This is why oftentimes we can't deal with that first leak in the chain. Because we don't want to go there. We don't want to go back to that traumatic thing or where, I, where this all started for us. And if you let it go, friends, if you let it go, and many of you know this from experience, there was a time in your life when it got to this right here and it wreaked havoc on lots of different areas. And James is very clear. He's like, deal with it at the root, man. Get that first link and deal with it properly. Minimal noise, and it helps you go through the actual trial. And learn something. Be better at the end of it. You keep acting like it's not real, like I got out of it. No. That's what you end up with. Have you been holding on to the trauma and the issues in your life? Have you been holding on to it? Letting it infect every area, every decision you make. Because when you do that, listen, once again, let's go back to it. You're not asking in faith when you ask the Lord. You're not, yeah, in faith, but I got all this baggage with me on this chain. I got to remember that, you know, because. And then that man, what should he expect from the Lord? James said, no. Austin, that sounds really strong. Like, I'm not supposed to have any doubts. I'm not supposed to have anything. It's not a doubt about the situation or how God's going to, like, our doubts, where, where it's okay in our doubts is like how God's going to actually work this thing out. Where the doubt is not okay is that he's actually going to work it out. I don't doubt that. I know you're going to work it out. God, I have no idea how you're going to do it. Like, uh, give, me some, give me some father of lights. Let me see you a little bit here. 
you're going to have some doubts of how this is all going to play out. God, I don't understand this. And that's where we ask in those things. And he's gracious to give us wisdom in those things. But where we can't doubt is doubt his faithfulness to actually get us through. That should be safe in the ground. God, I know you are faithful. I'm going to move on. James chapter 1, verse 21. All right, so we're going to jump a little up to another section as well, okay? Once again, what he hits in between these ones I'm skipping, we're going to hit later, okay? Verse 21 through 25. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility, receiving the word implanted. That's a greater truth, all right? That's a greater truth. The way you face doubts is with greater truth. Yeah, it may be true that your situation looks dire. The various trials are there. Yes, but what's kind of what we talked about last week. How you, how, one of the ways you make it through that is the greater truth. I have a God who gives generously. And I'm his servant. It's that greater truth, that implanted word is a greater truth than your circumstances. What if we begin to live according to the words of Jesus rather than our circumstances? Ooh, what a world that would be. But prove yourselves. And I said we. What if we? What if we did that? I'm on this, I'm on this train too. Verse 22. But prove Yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who look, looks intently at the law, at the perfect law, the law of liberty. What's, what's the perfect law? It's the law of liberty. It's the law of liberty. And abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man will be blessed in what he does. Blessed in what he does. This means the favor of God will be on you. The favor of God will be on you. Thomas Edison made the film at Light Bulb. Well, lots of people did, actually, apparently. But no one was able to make it like sufficient, where it, or efficient, is what I said. Efficient, where it could actually be used by people. Okay? And many of us know the story where he, uh, a, th a thousand times, he failed attempts. Uh, but one day he finally accomplished the task. He, he made a, 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 a light bulb that was actually used. And I want you to think about this. That's a lot of work to put into a light bulb, right? And so for Thomas Edison, every time after that he walked into a room and was lit up with a light bulb, he had a real good understanding of the sacrifice that it took for that innovation. He had a gratitude like probably none of us, right? Because he knew what went into this thing. I mean, like when's the last time you walked into a room and were like truly grateful that there was light bulbs in there? Probably if there wasn't light bulbs and it was pitch dark and you were trying to find something and finally there was a light bulb. You found the light bulb and you replace it. You're like, oh, I think that was the that was the only time you were grateful. This is this is childlike in a bad way. I'm not condemning you for not being thankful for every time. That would be an exhausting task. I'm just drawing attention to a point of how one person who actually innovates, there's a lot of sacrifice that like lays behind that innovation. And then the rest of us just get to participate in that innovation and we're not, we don't actually experience the gratitude and the sacrifice that it took to go into that thing. And this is childlike. It's my children saying, just buy it. Why can't we just go buy it? I'm like, that's a long, drawn-out thing that I need to tell you. First of all, it costs $6,000. I can't just go buy it. I can't just dig a pool in my backyard, money. Like we don't. It, it takes money. Money takes work and sacrifice, and then, then you got to store it. Like there's lots to this thing. It's, it's it's an immature view of something, right? When you don't understand the sacrifice that went into it, you don't see it the way it truly is. It's immature. Maturity is a product of understanding, and understanding is a product of sacrifice. 
the more you sacrifice for something, the better you understand it. And you can actually be grateful for this thing. We often take advantage of someone else's innovation without understanding the sacrifice it took for that innovation. When we don't understand the sacrifice which led to this innovation, it's hard for us to have a proper gratitude and maturity when utilizing that innovation. Someone else's innovation is not always good for our imagination, especially when it comes to faith. So here we go. We want to test the faith. We want to test the faith. Test of faith looks like this. I want the least amount of energy, attention, and cost for the greatest result. Now, Tesla's, apparently, if you live in certain places in the world, you just get in that thing, hit the destination, kick back, and chill. Just, it takes you there. I, very little energy on your part, very little tension on your part, very little cost at that point on your part. you got to make that initial investment. Faith. That's the kind of faith we that's the kind of faith we want. We want that faith where I just I look in the mirror and then I can set it and forget it. And I go on with my life without ever thinking about it again. I made that decision. I made that decision to follow the Lord. Now, I'm just going to go on my life. I'm good. It's back there. I made the decision. Just set it and forget it. So he looks at us. Face, like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror, and once he's looked at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets. It's like you get an understanding of what you are and who you are, and then you just walk away and live in complete forgetfulness of that reality. Set it and forget it. I put this we're inundated with automated. We want an automated faith where I can just set it, forget it, and go. And then we wonder why when we get in these trials, we're like, well, I have what I need. Well, because it's a daily relationship interaction. There's no automation to mature maturation. You can't automate that. And the moment that you try, what you end up doing is living on someone else's experience and their sacrifice. And you can talk, and I've said this before, some of us, we can, we can talk about the God's faithfulness in his life and her life and that person's life, but we don't have any stories of God's faithfulness in our life. All we have is a salvation experience. If that's you, that's automating faith. That's conversion without true discipleship, walking in the dust of your rabbi. I'm all for conversion, but conversion without discipleship causes a lot of problems. That's a vicarious faith at best, where I'm living vicariously through the faithfulness of others. And this is the problem. What happens is you don't see the faithfulness of God because you never stepped out in faith. And guess what? That takes you all the way back to number one. How are you supposed to act and ask in faith? And when you don't, why not? Because you don't understand the actual character of God and the faithfulness that he has. He's generous and gives to all That's lavish. <coughs> Growth and maturity are never a result of passivity. There is no set it, forget it faith. It's not happening. Worship man, you can come. Look at me. I'm not, I'm not super over time right now. So here we go. Here's some application questions I want you to think about. You can take pictures of them on the screen as the band comes. But here it is. Is your prayer line, your prayer pipeline established? If you are consistently failing at the front line, the problem is not the strategy, but your connection to the supply line. Prayer. Prayer is your supply line to the front line. If you're consistently failing in your trials and you consider it a problem, then what you're doing is you're failing in prayer. You're failing in faith, asking faithfully. And that's an issue with the character of God. Are you dealing with sin at the first link in the chain? Are you dealing with sin right here? Or is sin this big kebab of mess? Remember, it's a lot less noisy this way. It's a lot less noisy this way. But it's not easy. It's a lot less noisy, but it's not easy. That's why most 
You know, I'm not going to say most. I'm going to say some of the people I know are walking around with this big bag in their lives. Way down. Dirty from it. Exhausted. Trying to fight at the front line with this thing hanging in there. Because it's not easy to go to here. At the first link in the chain and actually deal with the desire and the issues that go along with that. Have you been in a set it and forget it type of state in your faith? Are you a set it and forget it Christian? You have a salvation story but nothing else. The rest of your life is much like those around you who are not followers of Jesus. If you're really honest. It's not what God would have us. It's not what James is trying to tell us to live like. He's saying your faith should work. It should look a certain way. You should, should look a different way, the way of Jesus, right? Well, I'll say it around here, we put a high priority on constant communication with our Father in heaven. We're not going to be successful out there. When, when you wake up Monday morning and say, Austin, it's Monday, now what? Pray. That's what. That's what James said. Ask. Know that you've got a generous God willing to give. So I'm never going to get away from this. What we need most is Emmanuel, God with us, the Spirit of God in our lives, present. More than anything else, you need to know that God's with you. And he is supplying everything you need through the Holy Spirit. You lack nothing when the Spirit is with you and you're connected. This is the other thing. If this is you, I'm not going to run from your noisy chain. I'm not afraid of it. You can make all the noise you want. If this is you, come to me. So that's what Jesus says. Come to me. I, if this is you, you didn't have to get here. You could have dealt with it at the little one. But if this is you, this church, we're not going to run from the messiness and the loudness. We will show you grace, mercy. This is a place to drop some chains, break some chains. Period. This other thing, though, we want you to drop that chain, but it don't end there. We're not just about conversion. We want to see disciples. We want to see. We want to see people who are covered in the dust of their rabbi. We want to see people walking the way of Jesus, and we're going to walk with you. We're going to walk with you. We're going to walk with you. We're going to know it's going to get messy. We may need to put some gloves on, and that's good. Grace and mercy, new every morning. Now, transparency. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you we got some work to do in this area. This is not easy. We need to create some more systems and processes that will facilitate apprenticeship to Jesus. And we're working on that. It's on our purview. It's on our minds. I want you to know that. It's on your, your pastor's mind of how we can walk with you as we walk the way of Jesus together. We're working towards that, okay? So as I'm gracious with you, I pray you would be gracious with me. Bottom line, prayer gives us what we need to break the chain of sin at the first link and be doers of the word. Be doers of the word. We ask. We ask. He provides what we need and then we go do. And, and what's awesome is he's right there supplying us in the front line the entire time. The entire time. And the great thing is we never, no matter how much we advance, we never get disconnected from our supply line because he goes with us. That means we can, we can step into as, as the gates of hell. They won't prevail on us. We'll walk in and out of it. We take the Spirit right with us. That's why we ain't afraid of the mess and the noises. So we know God's grace is greater. His Spirit is more powerful. He brings chains. He sets people free. He does it all the time. He did it in my life. He's done it in many of your lives. And we will sit and walk with people through that. Amen? Amen? Break the chain at the first link. Don't have a test of faith. We live in vicariously through others. Have your own story. Go on your own pilgrimage. I'm going to stop now.